In this video, I'm talking about the gender pay gap. I'm going to show how Marxist economics explains the existence of this gap, explains how this gap is developing, and how it will develop in the future. What is the gender pay gap? It's the fact that across most of the capitalist world, women are paid less per hour than men. UK government has comprehensive statistics on this. It has a database of all companies showing what the gap is in that company. So if we look at the Two Sisters Food Group, for example, a big uh, mass producer of food, women are paid 15% less. British Airways, women are paid 35% less. Greg's Bakeries, women are paid 21% less. Arga Cookers, women are paid 17% less. The striking exception is Northern Ireland, which has reversed the gender pay gap, and women are paid slightly more than men there. The trend over time is for the gap to slowly fall. The, the UK report on it says in 2017, men on average were paid £1.32 per hour more than women. The pay gap has fallen from 10% in 2011 to 9.1% in 2017, but remains positive, meaning that on average women are paid more than men. Well, that's a fairly slow change in Britain. But let's look at this in more detail by looking at some other countries and breaking down the figures. The USA, I'm showing a longer period of trend here from 1979 to, to 2013 in that case, there's a clear narrowing of, narrowing of the gap here. Um, the top line is men's pay, bottom line is women's pay. You can see that men's pay has been falling, women's pay has been rising. Um, so the gap has been closing because the inflation adjusted pay of men has been going down and the inflation adjusted pay of women has been rising. This is wages in current purchasing power. So this shows that whilst in 2013, the average male wage was $14, the purchasing power equivalent of that was about $16.5 in 1979. The average female wage was $12, Whereas in 1979, it was about um, $10.80. But we know that over that period, there's been a sharp increase in production, a sharp increase in the value produced per head, measured in current dollars. Here I'm showing in green men's weekly wages in current dollars and women's weekly wages in current dollars. Both of them appear to be rising sharply. But of course, the actual value of a dollar has been falling over that period. And the output produced in an hour's labour has been rising. The output in dollars, the number of dollars value added per per hour has been rising. When you deflate by the value added per hour, you see that men's wages have been falling in real value terms, which is what the previous graph showed, but even women's wages have also been falling in real value terms. If we express it in how many hours each worker got back for working a week? We see that in 1979, the average male worker got back 32 hours for a full working week, which back in those days would have probably been 42 hours, something like that. Now it's fallen to 23 hours. Actually, I've underestimated the working week in America. It's a good deal longer than Britain. Women's earnings in hours start at 20 uh, 
per week and have now fallen to 18.9 per week. So that in real terms, in terms of the real standard of value, which is human work, both sexes were getting back less than they were in 79. So we need to explain, firstly, why men's wages are higher than women's, secondly, why the gender pay gap has declined, and thirdly, why exploitation of both men and women has risen. Now Marx's theory of wages is that wages are not a payment for work done. Wages are the commodity cost of reproducing the ability to work and they're re regulated by the relative rates of accumulation of capital versus the supply of labour. This is what he called the reserve army of labour theory. And since labour can be reproduced in fewer hours than the working day, a surplus arises, which goes to the capitalist. This surplus is the source of profits. The fact that the number of hours required to produce the subsistence goods that workers live off is shorter than the working day. And those extra hours provide the profit. Now we can use statistics published by the US Bureau of uh, Labor to work out what the value created by an hour of labor in 2018 is, 2017 is. This is the total number of hours worked in the non-farm business sector of the US economy. And this is the total value produced in the non-farm business sector of the uh, US economy. If we divide the total value produced by the total hours worked, you get the monetary equivalent of labor, which is $40. But the median hourly wage in the US is only $18. And that's the value produced in the first 26 minutes of the hour. That means for each hour, the remaining 34 minutes produce profit. The workers, if we t this is a unisex average wa median wage, the unisex median wage is eighteen dollars. Value created is forty. Now, the wage is a reproduction price. It's the money price of the ability to work, and is set by the commodities that have to be bought to reproduce this capacity. That means food, clothes, heat, transport, housing, etc. that the workers have to buy in the open market to survive. And since it's a market price, it only matches the commodities bought, not goods and services that are obtained by, for free. It excludes certain things. All non-market use values are excluded from the money cost of labour power. So air, the warmth of, the, of summer, the joys of spring, all of those come for free. They are not included in the wage. More to the point in some countries, food grown at home on vegetable plots, that doesn't count. Free education, free health care in countries where it's free. The domestic labour of cooking and childcare. All of these things are non-market and therefore cannot enter into the price of a market commodity. Why are they excluded? It's because the money that a working class household gets all goes out on the purchase of marketed services. So the total wage has to equal total market purchases. In cases where workers are able to save that means the price of labour power has risen above its value. If, on the other hand, workers can only survive on state benefits plus their wage, then the wage has fallen below the value of labour power. Oh, sorry. What are the implications of this? The price of labour can deviate significantly 
or the price of labour power can deviate significantly from the total labour that's required to reproduce labour power. That's because a capitalist economy fits into non-capitalist relations. Now, the obvious example I cited before was housework. But if you look at the migrant labour system, which used to operate in apartheid South Africa, that relied on the workers during childhood being supported in the homelands on small farms and then being available for exploitation in the capitalist sector of the white economy. Another example is in the socialist economy where there are lots of free goods and services which use up labour and are necessary for the reproduction of labour power but don't appear as part of the wage. If we look at Victorian capitalism, there is a basic equation which covered this. The purchases of necessities on the left hand side here were equal to the earnings of the parents plus the earnings of children. In those days, children were sent out to work at a very young age. In modern capitalism, you can say that necessary purchases are equal to the earnings of the man in the household and the earnings of the women in the household added together. They have to be met out of those two sources. An important stage in the development of capitalism was the prohibition of child labour. The effect of this was to raise adult wages. The adult wage now had to be enough to support school-aged children who had previously have gone to work in the mills, etc. This goes back to this equation here, that the necessary purchases are equal to the earnings of the parents and earnings of the children. And the basic Marxian theory of wages is that there is a limit below which you can't drive necessary purchases. If you drive it below that, people start to starve to death. Now, we can rewrite this in the modern case as the necessary purchases are met by the male hourly wage multiplied by the number of hours that the average man works plus the female hourly wage times the number of hours the average woman works. So that breaks it down according to gender. But we can simplify it and take this form here and say that the necessary purchases are met by the total number of hours that the men and women in the average household work multiplied by the average unisex wage. A prediction of this equation is that if total household waged hours go up, the mean unisex wage will fall. Conversely, if total household waged hours fall, the mean unisex wage will rise. This is just a continuation of what occurred when child labour was abolished. If they can get less labour out of the working class family, the capitalists have to pay more per hour for that part of the family's time that actually is spent working. Now, what does this theory predict? It says, as the female share of the workforce gets closer to 50%, the gender pay gap will narrow. As the total labor supply per family increases, the average unisex wage will fall and as labour productivity rises, the labour equivalent of the family wage will fall. This constant here just says in terms of use values, it's unlikely to fall much, the family wage. But it doesn't mean that it doesn't fall in terms of labour time. As industry becomes more productive, most of the gains in productivity go as profits, not as increased wages. Now let's look at a, another case, country, Canada here. Here again, we see that the number of hours worked 
but per woman sorry this is not meant the median hourly wages of women rose the median hourly wages of men remained almost constant so the wage gap fell this is in 210 2010 dollars wage gap is falling and the women are catching up now in terms of consumer goods this means that the total amount of consumer goods in Canada that people could afford is actually going up a bit and the percentage of women who work has risen the percentage of men who work has fallen so the gap between the percentage of men and women working has changed it's reduced in fact if you correlate the gender pay gap with the gender employment gap you find that 90 percent of the gender pay gap is accounted for by variations in the employment rate which is basic confirmation of the Marxist theory Northern Ireland is an even more striking confirmation the the government publication women in Northern Ireland states that employer-based surveys estimate that 51 percent of all employee jobs in Northern Ireland are filled by women it also states full-time hourly earnings of females were £12.67, which was 3.4% greater than full-time males. Northern Ireland is the only region of the UK where full-time females earn more than full-time males. Now, this is what the theory predicts, that once the women become the majority of the workforce, they will tend to get paid more. Let's look at the, the US figures again. We see sharp convergence of the participation rates, decline in the average uh, participation rate by men, rise in the average participation rate by women. There's a drop off, steep drop off of both of them after the the um, 2008 crisis, but the long term trend is clearly for a narrowing. Now, what does this mean in terms of family income? I have shown you previously the columns for men's earnings in hours and women's earnings in hours. I've now added the participation rates, the percentage of men and women that are active in the economy. If you multiply these two together, you multiply men's earnings by men's participation rates, which is the probability that a man in the household will be employed, and women's earnings by women's participation rates which is the probability that a woman will be employed, we find the family income in hours is going down. The men's earnings in hours is going down, women's earnings in hours is going down, women's participation rates are, are going up, men's participation rates are going down, and the total family income in hours has gone down. The actual number of full-time equivalents delivered to the capitalist class, full-time equivalent um, days of labour, um, rose until to, to, rose until uh, 1997. Since then, it's fallen slightly, fallen slightly due to the decline in, in male participation since then, which has not been offset by female participation rates, which peaked around 1997. Now, the liberal claims are that capitalism brings progress, it improves women's employment prospects, and the gap between men and women's pay is narrowing. The capitalist reality is that capitalism brings increased exploitation for both sexes. The real value in terms of labor of women's pay is falling, and the gap is only closing because women are falling backwards more slowly than men are. If we contrast this with communism, the basic point of Marxist communism is that it abolishes gendered pay. It does that because it abolishes the wages system. Instead of people being paid in money, people are credited one hour of labour credits per hour worked, whether they're men or women. 
This is made clear in Marx's critique of the Gotha program. If we translate that into current American money, that would be a rate of pay of around $40 per hour for both men and women. Or rather, one labor hour's labor credit would be able to purchase goods that are currently sold for $40. Ask yourself, whatever your sex, wouldn't you be better off under that system?